Okay. Um, we hope that uh, you will find uh, answers to a few of your thoughts and questions, if not at all. You know, uh, we have at the most 90 minutes together. And uh, so uh, if you can write down your questions, you know, in the chat, and uh, we will read it to our uh, uh, presenter to get the answers to those questions when the time comes. Um, however, meanwhile, keep your microphones closed, you know, at all times and uh, um, keep your uh, cameras on if you can, you know, but if possible, if not, it's not a must, you know, and uh, as much as possible, try and not to do multitasking so you can gain maximum benefit from um, concentrating on this interesting topic. You know, as for the topic, uh, uh, the uh, observe, but not absorb, uh, do not absorb. It was one of our thought for today um, uh, uh, points. And uh, we had few inquiries about how it is all possible and instead of, uh, uh, you know, and one of them, the pressing question, you know, that how is it that we cannot absorb? Um, and so instead of answering one by one, we decided to turn it into a session. So uh, to reach to a point of understanding together. Um, so we asked uh, our dear uh, brother, you know, uh, Yogesh Sharda, to be the designated presenter uh, on this topic. Um, what uh, I wanted to share one little thing, you know, that I met Brother Yogesh way back in the, you know, in, in I think late 90s or early 2000, you know, in uh, Mount Abu, Madhuban, our headquarters, you know, back in India. And uh, apparently at that time he was facilitating a, a youth groups class session or something. And at that time, my son was attending uh, the that youth retreat. And so, um, and after the session, you know, uh, uh, in the afternoon, my son comes to the room, uh, you know, and, um, he was feeling happy and light. And uh, I asked him how the session went. And uh, he said that uh, the presenter is very fun, funny, mature, and tuned in to the needs of the youth. And then he, he added, he said, not unrealistically spiritual, but he's practical spiritual. <laughs> And I, I liked what I heard, and I was like, hmm, I like to meet this soul. I haven't met Yogesh before, you know. So, well, uh, you know, you will come to experience yourself, you know, that spirit in, in this presenter. And um, Brother Yogesh, he was born in Africa, you know, in, in Malawi, uh, but he was brought up in England. And now he is uh, um, coordinating activities and centers uh, uh, throughout Turkey. So uh, he has been uh, the uh, personal development trainer and workshop facilitator for over 22 years. But he was a student you know, of Raja Yoga at the Brahma Kumaris for over 42 years. So um, now, let us uh, um, take this time and uh, uh, observe and absorb <laughs> this valuable session with our um, special guests from Turkey and uh, um, find ways on how to observe but not to absorb things from the world out there. And so here we are. Thank you. Um, Brother Yogesh, for this uh, time that you have given us, and here is the floor is yours. 
or the spotlight is yours. <laughs> So, hello and a good evening from Istanbul, where I am. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for such a warm and generous introduction. So I, I hope I'm worthy of that. And uh, yes, I also do remember meeting you back in the late 90s. And I think I also stayed at your family house for a couple of nights. And so as you heard in the intro, uh, I've been studying and practicing this Raj Yoga meditation for most of my life, since I was around eight or nine years old. And so I've been very fortunate to have observed and learned from some very amazing spiritually mature people over that time. Um, and I use that word observe because I feel that's the, the main way by which I have learned things is learning to observe. And uh, today's topic is about observation, but not absorption of the things which could make us feel distressed or upset or angry. And so I'll be sharing some ideas from my own experience and also what I have seen and observed in these uh, is amazing spiritual giants I have been uh, growing up with over the decades. Now, one of the main things that we learn in our spiritual journey is that we need to take very good care of the mind. And why? Because it is the mind which feels, the mind which experiences. Now, think of any machine that you may buy, whether it's a mobile phone or a laptop. But along with that machine, uh, what also do you receive in the box? You receive a user manual. And this tells you how to use the machine correctly and also how to maintain it. And so the question arises, well, where is the user manual for the mind? How are you supposed to use this thing called mind? The mind produces thoughts, thought energy, which is the most powerful energy which exists. But yet, how are we supposed to use thought energy? What kind of thoughts are useful first thing in the morning? What kind of thoughts should come later in the day? How to put the mind to sleep at night? What makes the mind strong? What makes the mind weak? So there is a whole science, a whole education with regard to the art of thinking and using thought energy wisely, which generally speaking, we miss out on as we launch ourselves into life. And hence, in this regard, I would say there is more for us to unlearn than there is to learn. In fact, I would say there is the need to unlearn what we have mislearned so we can relearn what we should have learned. The spiritual journey teaches us this, that I need to learn and pick up new things. At the same time, I need to unlearn and let go of some old habits which are responsible for any stress I may experience in life. Now, we know, as was on the flyer, that... Uh, we live in a world in which there are many challenges, especially challenges we are passing through these days. But also, there may be challenges in individual life, in relationships, and so on. And so how could we approach life in such a way that uh, we can move through it 
with our peace of mind intact. Now, there are two main things that we focus on, really. And one is to maintain and increase our inner strengths. And the second is to know the correct attitude and vision towards life, people, and circumstances. So our inner strength, we're able to maintain and increase through a regular meditation practice and to have the correct approach, attitude and vision towards life, we learn that through spiritual knowledge and education. And both of these things together, meditation practice and understanding spiritual knowledge, both of these become the wings by which we're able to fly and make ourselves stronger. Indeed, to be able to use adversity to make ourselves stronger and wiser and more mature. So let's begin to look at some ideas uh, connected to this. And I have a few slides to show you, which will help me to explain some of these ideas. So let's, uh, let's start with this one here. So this is about approaches to life. So three different approaches one can have towards life. Uh, there are some people who feel like they are simply a passenger in the car of life. Uh, excuse so, me, Yogesh, but do you mind if you expand the the slide uh, to in the slide yeah. mode? Yeah, just a second. Is that any better? Bigger. Yeah, okay. So what is this and uh, approaches to life? What is being a passenger? So this approach is where one feels as though something called life is driving me. Uh, and I have pretty much a nil or very little control over where life takes me. And to people in this kind of mindset, they ask questions such as, how is life treating you these days? As though life is something outside of me and I have no control over the direction my life is going in. And sometimes when people are in this way of living, they can feel a little bit lost, a bit despondent, and maybe even a bit hopeless, as there is no sense of direction into where I need to go. So that's one possible approach. And then here is a, a second. And these are people who fight with life. And so they see something which they don't like, or they see some form of injustice in their own life, or in the life of somebody else, or even in the global sense. And when they see that, they begin to fight with life. And a person with this kind of approach creates tension in their mind. And it's almost as though they put on a war face when they deal with life. And when you see the face of such a person, you feel this person is, is in a state of war. And being in the company of such an individual also makes you feel a little bit tired, a little bit drained. So we don't want to be simply a passenger. We don't want to be fighting with life. But here is the option I think we're all interested in. Um, okay, just the image on the right, just look at that. This is the explorer. So an explorer is interested to know how life works. An explorer doesn't just see 
what is on the surface of life, but really wants to understand the mechanisms, the principles, the systems by which life happens, both in terms of one's own individual life, as well as in terms of what we may see happening in the world in general. The explorer is engaged in a, a journey of discovery. And I think the greatest of all journeys we can go on is to understand the self, is to understand the laws and principles of life, and also to understand the higher energy, the intelligent source, or you may call the divine being. And so that's the direction that we are heading in uh, this, this evening, this morning for you, is wanting to understand some of those principles. Now, one conclusion that uh, I think is very true is that life is the ultimate mind game. And if you look at any endeavor in life, uh, take sport, for example, especially individual sports, largely speaking, they are a mind game. Think of tennis, for example. Sports psychologists will tell you if you can play the shot in your mind, you can reproduce it on the court. Business is a mind game. Politics is certainly a mind game. In fact, the whole of life is a mind game. My relationship with myself, my relationship with people, and also my relationship with situations and circumstances. Here is one way of seeing um, how to approach life so as not to absorb the stress we may see around us. So let's say here is me and here is life, people, situations, events, circumstances. And what we tend to do is we try to control life. In our minds, we try to control life. Especially, we try to control the people in our lives. But you cannot control life. If you try to control life, then necessarily you will become stressed. But between me and life, there is my mind. The thing to do is to have control over my own mind. If I can control my mind, then life is unable to stress me. But there lies the big challenge. That we have such a deep habit in trying to control life, trying to control other people, and the result of that is we absorb all of those things in life which may not be so pleasant. We absorb them into ourselves and cause us some fear, some anger, some anxiety, and the whole range of negative emotions. It's part of the study in our Raj Yoga study, and that is that no matter what happens, first and foremost, I need to keep my mind peaceful and stable and stay in my own dignity. So to help to understand this, let's have a look at another image here, which just tells us about what you can control and what you cannot control. So this here is as you see, called the control continuum. So on the left is what we have more or less 0% control over. And on the right is 100% control. So in terms of the things which we may say are causes of stress or anger for ourselves or which cause us to feel negative emotions, here is a list of some of those things. So some people say traffic, 
politicians, noise, and then four behaviors of others, which generally around the globe, people consider stress inducing. So this should be disrespect, which can come in various ways. Injustice, which is, I think, a big one in the world. Uh, irresponsibility, dishonesty, and so on. And on the right is what we have 100% control over, at least potentially. And all of these things are connected with the self. My response to situations, my attitude, my words, my thoughts, and so on. My actions, my vision, so on and so forth. So this image tells us, if you try to control the things which cannot be controlled, then what would you feel or experience? You would feel stress. You'd feel disheartenment. You'd feel despondent. You may feel a little dejected. Because of this mistake, <clears throat> that's one of the things we have to unlearn, is to let go of the desire to control. Because these things are simply uncontrollable. But it doesn't mean to do nothing. We look at the other end of the spectrum and we see that I cannot control people and situations and events, but I can control my response to people, situations and events. So am I trying to control a situation or am I working on my response towards the situation. Making that shift from the left to the right, that is where much of the work is needed in terms of moving from absorbing to observing. And here's a little formula which can just help us to, to remember this more easily. So here we are, E plus R equals O. Now O stands for, as you can see, outcome. And it tells us there are two kinds of outcomes in our lives. There are those we are pleased with, and so there is no problem there. But then there are outcomes that we are not pleased with. Outcomes could be a situation in my life, maybe at work, that I'm not happy with. It could be the condition of a particular relationship in my life. The question is, in order to change the outcomes I am not pleased with, am I trying to change or control E, or am I trying to change and control R? If I'm trying to control E, the event, the person, the thing outside of me, then hello stress, hello anguish, hello some grief. If instead I shift my focus to controlling and empowering and enhancing my response, then I have just as much impact and influence over the outcome. So it's a simple formula, but something to remind us. Every time I feel I'm becoming stressed or irritated, in inverted commas, because of something, because of someone, let me remind myself of the truth. E plus R equals O. Let me stop trying to control the event, the person or the thing, but work on my response to the event. And so we shift from absorbing that negative energy which may be around us to learning to observe it. Now, what helps in doing this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is just learning to 
make the mind still, learning to build meditations into our daily life. So what I'd like to do now is to take us into a simple creative visualization to see how fairly easy it is to relax the body and also to relax the mind. So this simple one is called as the quiet room of peace. So I will speak out a few words as a guiding commentary. And I invite you just to follow that as best as you can. It can help to have your back straight and feet on the floor if you're sitting on a chair. And if you wish for this visualization, you may close your eyes or have them half open or as you feel comfortable. Okay, so it's a very simple one. And let's take a few moments to experience visiting the peace which has always been inside us. So I take these next few minutes to relax the body and also to relax the mind. The world outside of me is the world of sound and movement. It is the world of doing, the world of actions. And I have little control over the world outside of me. But there is also a world inside me. It's the world of my thoughts, <clears throat> the world of my feelings, and my experiences. And the world inside me is in my own hands. So, let me experience the peace which is at the very center of my being. So, just bring your attention up towards your face. Bring your attention to the center of your forehead. And here at the center of the forehead, just picture a small room. This tiny room in the center of the forehead is your quiet room of peace. Visualize this very pleasant, quiet room of peace in the center of the forehead. This is your private and personal space. And when you are inside your quiet room, you feel very relaxed. This is the place where 
you can be yourself. Inside your quiet room, you are safe. You are secure. You are able to let go of the roles and responsibilities of your daily life. Inside your quiet room, you are free from the pressures and the demands of the outside world. Feel the peace, the wonderful silence of your quiet room. Just allow your mind to absorb this atmosphere of serenity, tranquility. As you do so, thoughts, Begin to slow down. The mind becomes quiet. Calm. Relaxed. peaceful and free. Just be with this feeling of peace in your mind for one minute. Thank you. So, hoping that was useful for you, and I would think many of you do meditation anyway, but very good little exercise just to detach and withdraw from the mode of doing and come to the mode of being. And I feel we need to do this more and more as we're surrounded by maybe more stress, negative emotions around us as a result of what we see and hear. But to go to that sacred space within myself where I can just be Experience the peace, allow the peace to wash over me, recharging the battery of the soul. Then you come back into your work, your meeting, feeling much more centered and balanced. Now, <clears throat> I think there are people who meditate and there are meditators. What's the difference between these two? 
I think there are many people who do some kind of meditation to to de-stress, to relax, to calm down, to face the challenges of life. And for some, that may be enough. But to be a meditator means it's a lifestyle. And that means as we're going through the day-to-day -day life, whether it's at work or at home or traveling, one part of you is naturally alert and vigilant to check to see what am I doing with my thought energy? How am I spending my thought energy? Am I overthinking? Am I over emoting? Am I thinking wastefully? Think, for example, of an athlete who wishes to win the gold medal in the races. Now, for her or for him, eating healthy is a lifestyle. Such a person would have a natural awareness what I eat, when I eat, how much I eat. Because for an athlete, maintaining optimum weight is essential. In much the same way, to be a meditator means to be a mental athlete. And that means as you pass through the day, you're involved in your work, you're handling your responsibilities, you're taking care of your relationships. So you may be very much in life, but still you are aware of the inner life and you're aware that my thought energy is the most precious resource I have and I don't want to waste it. And anytime you notice yourself wasting, which of course happens to all of us, but then you correct yourself and say, okay, mind, that's enough. Mind, now put a full stop to this series of thoughts. Mind, let's be quiet. Mind, Let's go to that quiet room of peace. So you supervise the behavior of your mind because you know your thoughts eventually will reflect into your life and your life circumstances. And I think this should be something natural for everyone. We should learn how to manage our minds and emotions as naturally and as regularly as we learn any subject in life, taking care of our physical health or managing our finances or anything we're studying, taking care of the inner self should become a life skill in order to be able to manage the challenges which come in front of us. Let's look at one or two more ideas in terms of where we need to pay attention to better manage what we see happening around us and learn to be in that observer state. So here is a, a formula which helps us to understand what I need to pay attention to and uh, what I need to reduce in my life. In order to be an, an observer, um, I need strength. Understanding and knowledge will take me a certain length, but I also need strength, energy, the power to be able to do it. So how can we increase our inner strength such that we're able to increase our resilience and therefore be in that observer condition. Well, this formula here is telling us that our level of inner strength is connected to two things. One is the effort we make for anything. And second, divided by the waste which we are also producing. Now, this is a generic formula you can apply to anything, even to, uh, to machinery. 
<clears throat> in terms of productivity and efficiency. But for our sake, what does it mean, effort? What does it mean, waste? So effort means to, to do the right thing more. And that means, as mentioned already, building moments of silence, building meditation moments into our daily life. So, for example, one of the things to really build into life is to start the day with some meditation. So before we go out into the world and think of people, responsibilities, the news, the traffic, the weather, before we think of those things, first, let me go inside and experience the peace which is within me. Let me start the day by dwelling in that thought, I am peace. I am a peaceful being. I am a peaceful soul. My deepest and truest nature is peace. So allow myself to dwell in that thought for a while. It really charges your soul battery first thing in the morning. And as has often been said, whatever you experience in the morning is going to impact you throughout the whole day. If I have a good peace meal, if I have a good peace experience first thing in the morning, it will help to keep my mind and emotions stable when the challenges come during the day. I've equipped myself to be able to manage them if I've done this experience in the morning. Second thing with regard to effort, build into your day at least two or three moments where you visit the quiet room. And uh, you can choose times which work for you. I would certainly say one mid-morning, maybe 10.30 or so, another one mid-afternoon, perhaps 2.30, another one maybe a bit later, perhaps 5.30. Choose times which work for you specifically, according to your schedule, but try to stick to them every day. And I would suggest that if this is something new for you, try for one week in a very systematic way and see how you feel at the end of that one week. And usually people report that they feel much more balanced, much more energetic, much more in control of their thoughts and emotions. Third thing with regard to effort is then how to close the day. Now again, the mind is a great technology. It has a mechanism by which it works. And that mechanism needs to be respected. So think, for example, of how we may log off our laptops at the end of the day. You go through a process. You sign off, you log off, you switch off in order to turn off the machine in a, in a good way. In the same way, the mind needs to be put to sleep in such a way that the thoughts are put to one side and the sleep also becomes restful. So one suggestion I was given when I was growing up was this, that consider the whole of life to be like a, a theatre performance, a big drama. And for today, the curtain has come down. Today is over. Whatever happened today, I may have done something amazing, I may have made a ridiculous mistake. I may have been praised. I may have been criticized. But for today, the curtain has come down. Multiply everything by zero. Empty the mind of the thoughts of the day. Allow the mind to be light and then go to sleep. And if we do that, then the sleep is more deep and restful. And the next morning really does feel like a new day. 
I think in the past, people were more aware of these things. But in our 24-hour lifestyle, 24-hour news, 24-hour everything, we seem to have lost touch with some of these wise and simple ways of living to manage our mind and our emotions. So these are three things you may like to experiment with if they are new for you. So do the right thing more, make more effort, but then do the wrong thing less, that is reduce the waste. Now, how do we waste the energy of our inner being? Two things we can pay attention to, to reduce the wastage. One is to be more essenceful and economical with our words. And secondly, to be more essenceful and economical with our thoughts. Generally, for most people, we overspeak and we overthink. The result of that is the mind gets tired. When the mind is tired, we absorb everything from around us. We become very sensitive. We may find ourselves becoming reactive as well. So here lies a great potential for us to upgrade our inner power. If we pay attention to this, can I be more essenceful? in my speaking. Instead of saying a hundred words to someone about something, can I say the same thing in 60 words? Therefore, that 40 word energy which I save, it will accumulate in the mind as something called the power of silence. Now, what happens is as this power of silence accumulates in the mind, then you find you have new abilities which you before lacked. So for example, you're able to tolerate something or someone which before you found very difficult. You have the courage to face someone whom you always avoided. You have the power to be patient whereas before you would get irritated or impatient. Now, where is this new power coming from? Where is this extra power coming from? It's the result of reducing the waste. Fewer words and fewer thoughts, more essenceful and more impactful, and just see how the mind becomes more powerful as we are able to do this. So hoping that so far is making sense and there are some tips in how you can apply these things. I think for all of us, no matter how long we may have been on this spiritual journey, whether it's a few weeks or a few decades, there's always space to upgrade especially with how we are using our thought power. So just coming to one or two more things as we, as the time moves on. So here is something which uh, tells us about emotions and um, makes us aware of um, how we can be in charge of our own emotions not feel that we are somehow a victim of what's happening around us. So as you see in this diagram here, we have three different points. The first one is about events. Now we are all surrounded by different kinds of events in life. Event could be something happening right in front of you. Event could be what we see in the streets as we walk through the streets and we see the advertising, the billboards. Events could be the things we see on the world news. These are all events happening around us all the time. 
And there is not a great deal we can do about most of the events we are surrounded with. But here is what we end up doing. Figure number two here says that from our minds, we give meaning to those events. The event is outside of me, but the meaning I am giving to it with my own mind. And this happens in a nanosecond. This happens so quickly, we don't even realize we are doing it. And just as quickly, an emotion is generated. And so it's in the snap of a second, event meaning emotion, event meaning emotion. It happens very, very quickly. And because it's so quick, what we think is happening, which is not true, is that the event is directly creating my emotions. Therefore, we even say things like, I feel very angry because of what you said to me this morning. I feel very upset because of what happened yesterday. I feel very anxious because of X, Y, Z. That's what we believe is the reality, but in fact, it is false. I don't feel angry because of what you said to me. I feel angry because of the meaning I'm giving to what you said. I'm not upset because of what happened yesterday. I'm upset because of the meaning I'm giving to what happened yesterday. In other words, the events do not create my emotions. It is the meaning I give to the events which creates my emotions. Now, this is both bad news and good news for us. The bad news is with regard to my negative emotions, uh, there is no one to blame. So apologies for that. But the good news is exactly the same, that if I'm able to decide and give higher meaning to the events, my emotions, the way I feel, is going to be in my own hands. This is a very big part of the shift from absorbing to observing, is let go of the events, pay more attention to the meaning you are giving to events. This, of course, raises the question, what is meaning made up of? What are the components of meaning? What is behind meaning? Indeed, what is the meaning of meaning? And so let's look at the next slide, which helps us to understand what meaning is comprised of and how this can help us in our own practical lives. So here are the three main components of meaning. As you can see, one is our perception, our perception filter. Two is the perspective, literally the position from which we are viewing something. And the third is the context within which we are choosing to see life. And each of these three has a very big impact upon the meaning that we are giving to events. If we wish to upgrade the meaning, we need to explore what these three things are. And so let's have a look at this. And uh, especially with regard to things which may be happening in our own lives, which we find are giving us, appear to be giving us some stress or some anguish. What can I do about it to change the way I feel? Well, here is a model of uh, our 
perspective. So as you can see, here is the spectrum of perspective and at the top, we can call it open or um, elevated, high. And at the bottom of this line, we can say our perspective is low or it is closed. And on the right is the eye of your mind, the way your mind is seeing a situation. At the bottom here, we see that, let's say you have some challenge in your personal life. And when perspective is low, you may see it as a problem. You may address or label that situation or even that person as a problem. If you label someone or something as a problem, how might you feel? Now, this may generate feelings of anxiety, or worry, or tension in your mind. Because you become problem conscious. I have this problem in my life. But if you say to yourself that I accept that there is this situation in my life, but let me choose not to see it as a problem. Let me choose to see it as an obstacle. So then the question arises, well, what is the difference between a problem and an obstacle? So problem is like I see something in my way and I focus on that thing. And I may give up. But when I see the same thing as an obstacle, I do not focus on the thing. I focus on myself. And I ask myself, how can I get over this? How can I find a way around this? How can I find a way through this? So the focus has shifted from the thing or the situation or the person to, to me. And I find that uh, for most things, the way to overcome any obstacle in your life is to focus upon one or another form of virtue. In some situation, I need to work on tolerance. In another situation, I need more patience. In some other situation, I need to practice forgiveness. Dealing with somebody else, I need a lot of humility. So it becomes a game of knowing which virtue is required in which situation, in which relationship, to help me to overcome that particular obstacle. The result is the situation may stay the same for a while, but it will no longer steal my peace and my happiness. And I believe that the more we absorb virtue into our character, the more easily we are able to overcome the obstacles which may come in our lives. It is the highest and most elevated form of learning and study, the study and research of virtue. Then as we continue to raise our perspective, now the same thing I see as an opportunity. So here is a chance for me to practice, to apply in my life the things I'm learning. Furthermore, as the perspective rises, now the same situation I am seeing as a test. Now generally we tend not to like tests, but tests are useful for me to know what I have learned and what I need to pay attention to. We take our bodies for a test, which is called a health checkup. If something is not quite right, then we may take some treatment for that. We take our car or motorbike for a test, where they would check the brakes, the wipers, and so on. In the same way, for a person who is spiritually aware or self-aware, 
when challenging situations come up, I can see it as a test for myself. I may think I'm a very honest person. How to know until some situation tests me? I may think I'm very humble, but how do I really know until some scenario is there to test that? So we don't run away from a situation. We see it as chance for self-assessment. And then the final stage here is what I used to see as a problem, now I see as a gift. I see that, yes, it was difficult, it was challenging, it stretched me. But you know, I learned so much through that situation. It was like a gift for me. There are people, remarkable people, who have gone through very challenging situations. They come out the other side. They say, it opened my eyes. I was able, I'm now able to see life very differently. Now, we may not have such extreme situations, but this same line of thinking can help us to pass through situations without absorbing the stress from them. Now, just going to show you one last slide, if I may. Then we have some time for questions and discussion. This really is taking us into a whole other area. And this model is called the inner kingdom of the self. And in a way, this really is the essence of the whole Raja Yoga study that we do. The aim of which is to become a self-sovereign, a master over my own self. So as you can see, this uh, monarchy is such that you, the soul, you are the monarch, you are the king. And uh, in your kingdom, you have these three ministers, which are the mind, the power to think, the intellect, which has the power to discern and to decide. And this word sanskaras, which is an amalgamation of your habits, your tendencies, your traits, the impressions left upon you after you have performed any action. And now we have five subjects. And these, as you see, are the five senses. So how this helps us with uh, being a detached observer is this, that when I am really in my spiritual consciousness, I'm aware of myself as being the soul energy, the master, the monarch, the king. And the job of these five subjects is to bring five different kinds of information about the world to me, the king. And the two main senses out of the five with regard to information about the outside world. One are the eyes, the second are the ears. So how it should be is like this. I see something, my, my eyes see something. They bring that visual information to me, the king. And I, the soul, I, the king, I decide how I want to respond to that. My ears bring to me visual info, audio information about the world outside. I, the soul, the king, I receive that information and I decide how I want to deal with it. But here is what happens. For example, let's say you hear something you don't like. You hear your name being trashed. You hear people saying, not good things about you. And if that causes you to feel upset, or irritated or anxious, it means at that moment, the ear is sitting on the throne. The ear has thrown me off from my throne and the ear has become the boss. And so in this condition, the real boss, the soul, is now subservient to the ear 
or subservient to the eyes. When we're in that disempowered condition, we absorb everything we see and hear, we get very much affected by it. This condition, known as the detached observer, comes when I picture myself as being the soul in the forehead, and I'm aware I am the master, the ruler, the malik, the raja of my own inner kingdom. I may see something which may not be to my liking, but I'm not going to allow what my eyes see to steal my happiness and my peace. My eyes are my subjects, my workers. My ears are my subjects, my workers. Their job is simply to inform me. And I, the soul, it is my right, my duty to choose my thoughts, my emotions, and my responses to what I see and what I hear. This is really the deep practice of this detached observer consciousness, which truly helps us to be unaffected by situations and people around us. Now, why to be a detached observer? It's not simply to fold my arms and say, well, I'm detached and your problem is your problem. But the, the aim of being the detached observer is such that I maintain this clean space within my inner self through which I can be a, of help to others. We describe this as be a detached observer and then be a benevolent observer and in fact be a benevolent doer. If I can keep my sacred space clean, free from anger, ego, anxiety, worry, then from that clean space, I'm able to actually help others with my thoughts, maybe with my words, maybe with my actions, but certainly with my thought energy and also with my attitudes. And this is the state of uh, people today. People really, really need a lot of spiritual support. And so let me learn to look after my peace of mind and happiness and just help others by radiating that, that vibe of calmness and relaxation. So their minds also feel peaceful. And then they may be inspired to learn how to handle their own feelings and be the masters of their own peace. So I think I need to stop there. And uh, just invite Lisa back onto the yeah. Digital stage. I have a question for you. Uh, so the king is receiving the information and the subject ear is delivering the information. Um, not to be subservient. What does the king do in that situation when um, the name is being trashed? Yeah. First thing is, you know, to remember, I am not a name. Uh, the name is a label. And when people trash the name or say whatever they say, they are just mirrors for me to check my level of self-control. So there I have not to see the person or think of the person, why she or he is trashing my name. But I have to talk to my ear internally, okay, ear. Uh, I am listening through the ear. Ear, I, I choose to keep my dignity. I choose to keep my peace of mind. Talking to the self, the way this person speaks is his or her choice. The way I feel is my choice. It's an internal dialogue. Am I trying to Am I giving more attention to the choice the other person is making? Or am I giving more attention to the choice I'm making in terms of how I wish to feel? So this, when this becomes a habit, then you're able to maintain your inner dignity quite naturally 
regardless of who says what. That makes sense. So that means that the king needs to practice more being the king and stop uh, stepping down from that <laughs> throne and, and allow the subjects be subjects and the king be the king, right? Yeah, in basic, uh, basically, sit on your throne and stay there. Don't move. Because <laughs> yeah. we have the habit of coming off the throne and, you know, and then everything gets, uh, gets complicated. Just sit on your throne, stay there all the time. And the whole kingdom self harmonizes. So one uh, one thing that uh, someone said uh, is that even though I know this makes sense, and uh, I even have the whole of the spiritual knowledge to support me and back me up, but uh, it's so hard to remember it when a situation arises when suddenly you know um, you're hit by a surprise. Uh, accident of some sort um, any tips or tricks to overcome it in the moment rather than yeah. um, be defeated yeah it's true you know in the heat of the moment suddenly things happen which can catch you by surprise what I find and I'm not sure about the uh, the individual you mentioned but you know um, if we're able to have early morning meditation it's the game changer um as you many of you know that those of us who practice raj yoga we get up fairly early like you know about four o'clock um this may or may not be possible for you but if we wake up early in the morning whenever we can it really makes our intellect very very receptive to be able to pick up uh, what I need to do in any situation. Our intellect is like an antenna, which can recept as a very sensitive uh, rece receiver to pick up, in this situation, I need to respond in this way. And it really affects the whole of our day when we are able to absorb those early morning energies um, and of course, in addition to the early morning meditation, if I spend the first part of my day in some spiritual study, it again, it heightens me spiritually. So we are in a state of ever readiness to deal with whatever may be thrown at us during the day. It's like we're in high alert in a very, very natural and comfortable way. Right. That's the thing, to remember to apply the game changer, which is uh, meditation early in the morning when everything else is asleep and I am uh, uh, using the antenna to uh, tune in with the right energy and to stay awake the whole day. That yeah. makes sense. Um, just to let you know, many souls are... Um, uh, participants who are here are, are uh, thanking you for uh, having presented uh, such elaborate presentation with so many tools and ways and um, few said that they cannot wait to get the recording to listen and I wanted to say me too because uh, as much as I knew about the uh, the subjects and the ministers and the king but uh, this became much more visual and much more practical for me to see how not to allow um, my uh, either soul become subser to become subservient to the ministers you know and uh, to take charge so thank you very much for uh, presenting this uh, very very valuable uh, um message and that it is very timely for all of us because each one of us are dealing with either individually or culturally or socially um, politically any which way we want to look at it environmentally you know weather wise climate change so many ways that we're being affected that um, um 
it's best to find ways not to get affected and to reverse the effect uh, for me to influence the environment rather than the other way around, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we can do is maybe in closing, uh, um, I will send you all the uh, thanks and appreciations and gratitudes from everyone else later on. We'll, we'll, we'll make a copy and send it to you. But um, we can do the closing meditation and uh, thanking everyone else, um, everyone who has participated, you know, in this uh, uh, special uh, class or talk. And uh, Brother Yogesh, for your insightful presentation. And what I took uh, from uh, this talk was uh, how um, taking very good care of my mind. And uh, just like when you said at the beginning, the manual, uh, every, every machine comes with a user manual. And the uh, user manual is to be used both how to use it properly and how to maintain it. And um, again, didn't think about mind that way, but now I, I recognize that it's very important to take good care of it because uh, it's essential for all of us, you know, to be able to stay healthy. And um, uh, we have more uh, events coming up, you know, so if you just go to uh, our website, um, bklosangeles.org, go to the calendar of events, and then you will see the different things that are happening there. But there is one that is coming up on 27th of uh, April. It's for the parents <laughs> or those who are um, doing parenting. It's, it's called Parenting with Love and Wisdom. So if anybody is interested or has anybody who has uh, needs parenting tips, that will be the day to join. Um, but for now, to close, Yogesh, brother, if you can please guide us into the closing. But it's not the closing. It's not the end. It's just continue to stay tuned in with the right energy. Yes, sure. Thank you. So once again, if it's okay for you, have your back straight. Just be in a comfortable, but also relaxed and alert position. So this time, let us go a little deeper into experiencing soul awareness, soul consciousness. So I ask myself, who am I? Behind the roles I play every day, Who am I? Behind the labels I wear. Who am I? Behind the masks that I wear. Who am I? There is more to me than these roles, these labels, these masks. And even when I look in the mirror, I see the reflection of my face, my body, 
but there is more to me than simply this. So I bring my attention up towards my face. I bring my attention to the center of the forehead. And here I picture a beautiful star of peaceful light. Wonderful star of peaceful and healing energy in the center of the forehead. This wonderful sparkling star this is me. This is I, the eternal soul. I am this living point of spiritual energy. I, the soul, I am light. I, the soul, I am eternal. I, the soul, I am peace. I, the soul, I am free. Just be with this feeling of peace for a moment. Keeping this peace, keeping my freedom, keeping my dignity, I now return to the awareness of 
of this room. everyone and wishing you all well and uh, thanks again to Lisa and the team in LA for the chance to be with you and to to share some ideas <laughs>